five, four, three, two. Tier one performance. in the family and then we got blake running around rampant on the baseball field yes. as a junior uh, junior going to a senior senior, year. senior yep. year right and he is just are they finished with their season or they still got a couple more tournaments they've got two more left two more left all right yeah so as someone who's played as a high schooler a college kid and a professional athlete what's it like going into the parent aspect of it i had, for me being first time it's it's gut wrenching, uh, you know. Back, it's funny. We had less, I don't know, things to do when I was playing, but I, it turns out it's so much easier. Yeah. I and mean, what they do now, it, it's just it's extremely complicated, you know. And, and as a parent, uh, I thought I've been through it before, but this day and age, Not even no. Close. No, yeah. I'm, I'm actually feel like I'm learning over again. I mean, the amount of, you know, you, you talk to everybody and all oh, that's a money grab. Oh, this is a money grab. Don't do this. It's not worth your time. You know, do, it, it's it's you might as well just roll the dice. Yeah. Honestly, sure. I, I mean, I'm, I'm still trying to live by that that theory of the old adage of if you're good enough, they'll find you. Because honestly, I mean, you know, you, you go to these tournaments, you go to these places and you well, there's coach, there's a scout, there's a college coach. That, then you're just like, okay, I don't. Am yeah. I supposed to go talk to them, or am I supposed to? What am I doing? So you think it's more stressful as a parent than it is a, as a player? Without a doubt, without a <laughs> doubt. Because at least as as a player, you went out on the field, you did your job. Yeah. If you did your job right, there they were. Right, right. You know, now it's well, you got to fill out that. You got to fill out this. You got to go to this. You got to go to that. You got to. I'm I'm just talk, I'm just like I said, just rolling the dice because I don't know. I keep telling Blake, just just do well. Because I don't know what else to tell you. Right. You know, and, and later on this summer, it was, well, did you sign up for this? Did you sign up for that? I'm like, I don't know. I, 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 it's so much more stressful as a parent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I bet. And it's also not really cheap either. No, not even close. Not even close. I was about Just to the, the PG event that, they, that we went to in Atlanta, they had their little, I don't know what you call it, before the tournament even started. They... 500 just step on the field and, that's and steep. that was without you know we had to pay airfare hotel rent a Travel, car, all that all stuff. that stuff and Food, then it was things. was is blake doing the what's and i went um yes i don't know should he i don't know and then i looked and went 499 dollars for them to record your son take his stats see how tall he is see what he weighs oh my goodness you know and i just went 500 now you want to talk about a money grab? Yeah. So going in and trying to avoid all these money grabs, what do you think is absolutely essential from your eyes at this point as to seeing your son get recruited? Or because like he people have been talking to him, so like and uh, and a lot of people are in that um, kind of gray area where they don't know if someone's talking to them or not. They want people to talk to them, or people aren't talking to them at all. So, like, what what are kind of the must-haves for getting recruited at this time? To me, I, you know, as, as a former player yourself, yeah. I, I think what you do on the field speaks for itself. I, You know, because parents have a tendency to, you know, I wouldn't say stretch the truth a little right. bit. But when you're out on the field, it, like when we were in San Marcos, the entire Texas State coaching staff was there. Right. And so they got to see every at bat, every throw, every catch, every everything you did on that field, they were sitting in the press box. And you saw every one of them with clipboards, stopwatches. So mm -hmm. to me, I, I, I looked at Blake, I said, look, there you go. They're That's up there. That's all you need. I told them, they're up there. They're watching you every move. Yeah, because when, um, I think it's, now like a full year to the day a full oh look at this guy coming oh, in oh my God. hey we're, we're trying to do business here oh, I just want to watch. <laughs> <laughs> um no it's been a full decade 
starting this year of when I was recruited in high school and things have already changed so much. Oh, it's it's amazing. Like social media is being used in on it. Um, it's not emailing. Everyone needs a video or it's or it doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah, that's what right, I'm saying. You know? I mean, the amount of, of things they expect from you now, you know, when at least when I was in high school a long time ago, yeah. it was perform on the field and I'll talk to you. Yeah, you know, I, I didn't need to send. You know, yeah, we might may have done a phone call or two with the coach, but other than right. that, they didn't need. I didn't need to, to go to this camp or go to this showcase and, and give them my money and, and fill out the forms, and maybe somebody will come and talk to you. Yeah, you know, right. it's it's difficult now because there's so many avenues, uh, in, including the portal. I mean, now it's it's like yeah, we don't really take freshmen anymore. They're like oh, unless I'm a pitcher. Oh, okay. Good to know. And so high school guys, to me, have less now because of the portal. And it's really interesting because um, we had somebody on last week, uh, Gabe Solis, um, somebody that Mitch introduced me to. Um, and, yeah, he said that JUCO was important back then, but it's even more important now. Because no question. No question. These coaches have these um, – they're looking at the people in the portal first, other D1 guys, other people that have experience, and then they're looking at, you know, guys that they have already brought in, and then the bottom of the totem pole is your high schooler, is your star high schooler. Absolutely. And so now it gives them a window opportunity for JUCOs to come in and develop them, and then everyone's just going to be feeding out of that portal and no doubt. JUCO transfers. And I kind of seem like – I kind of to me it feels like it's kind of turning into like hockey, you know, when they go to that uh, – the school, to, right. like development school or whatever right. they call yep. it train for one or two years and then you got a 21 year old freshman <laughs> going into bc just <laughs> taking yeah, bodies like, out okay you know? uh you know and then my son's like well who am i competing against well you're you're 17 and you're competing against a 21 year old now yeah an absolute adult yeah in his prime so it it, it takes away that angle you know yeah. um uh, i was talking to uh todd Whitty and the coach at university of houston and he was saying we have guys on staff that all they do is watch the teams that come in that we're playing Oh, for the portal in case they want to live. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, that's crazy. They literally will scout the teams coming in, and when the portal opens up, they just do this and go, oh, he's in the portal. Oh, let's make a phone call. You oh, know, and, and it, we went down there uh, for, you know, one of the scouting events, and, you know, they, they it's funny. Before, they used to have just high school kids coming into these things. Yeah. Well, now they – I was looking going, that kid does not look 18. And it turned out that the, these showcases now have JUCO players coming in. Oh, for the showcases? Mm -hmm. that's so you've got everything from 16, 17-year-olds to 21, 22-year-olds at oh, these wow. showcase events. And it makes it difficult for these, these high school kids, you know, to compete against somebody who's 21, 22 years old. Right, of course. You know, and so it just, it just again, makes it that much more difficult. Um, and, and the reality is there. The reality is you either do it or you don't. And, um, you know, you, I, I tried to tell my son, look, kid, don't compete against that guy, that guy, or that guy. They're already sophomores in college. Right. You know, but it makes sense. You know, with the portal now, they got to look at everybody. And so I think it's, it's almost harder for college coaches now because of, of the, the widespread that they're picking from, you know, it's like they got to produce immediately too yeah exactly it's not like a year or two to develop no more off years they kind of yeah, go in and show up yeah you're coming in at 22 23 years old you yeah. know i guess you know when you watch these when we watch the college world series some of these guys were 23 24 years old already from that covid year uh -huh. yep. still and that's crazy like six <laughs> years seven years super <laughs> quadruple seniors yeah, you hope they're doctors by now <laughs> yeah <laughs> have mbas mds pe's all that stuff yeah no absolutely crazy but yeah it's kind of it's kind of insane um starting how that pandemic kind of changed everything 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 and set everything up and then you know the new rules with the ncaa um, just allowing players to get paid in the nil oh yeah i was having a huge influx over, oh, yeah. over a lot of people like um I know I have a couple of coach. I know a couple of coaches at schools, and I'm asking them how the recruiting process is going, and they're just like, 
it's tough with the portal. Like you, it's almost like you don't want your guys to do too good because then yeah, they're right. gone. True. Right. That is and true. then you like then if you got got but like on the flip side, if you got guys that do bad and you need to cut them, you can make your whole group stronger by going into the portal and taking guys as well. That's what I'm saying. Now that's also not to bring down that they still they still look at high schoolers. It is just I would say a little bit harder mm-hmm. to get picked up D1 versus like back when Mitch and I got picked up because I think when we were going through the recruiting process, a big a big part of getting into just being looked at was being in the right circuit. Oh. Like, because you got, as you know, like, there's been a huge influx of select travel ball teams and self-proclaimed best teams in the Houston area or whatever city they're from, and they come down and then, you know, they're playing all these tournaments. And, yeah, you can win all these tournaments, but if no one's watching you, what's the point at this at this level, Absolutely. at this age, right? So I think, like, it's kind of – it's almost like counterproductive – to to play versus like going to like a camp and wasting all this money unless you're in that circuit yeah. or at least you should be trying or fighting to get in said circuit but it's like it's very close in it it's true because i, I mean there there's been some of, of these events that that blake's been invited to that uh he hasn't had to pay and you know uh, immediately it's oh those are the ones you want to go to they're they're mm-hmm. serious like if you don't have to pay okay and so what are you supposed to do? How do you know, you know, what you're doing? And, you know, I just sit there and go, uh, I don't know, Blake, you want to go to this one? Because I'm leaving a lot of it up to him because I'm trying to get him to narrow down what schools he wants to go after. And what I mean by he wants to go after is call the coach, send them the videos. Because mm-hmm. you're not going to do that to every school. It's just going to be a waste of your time. Right. So I'm trying to get Blake. And the other thing, too, is I, I really – I don't know how to say this, but I really haven't been telling Blake all the truth. Because I still want him deep down to, to say, this is what I want. I'm going after it. Yeah. I mean, could you imagine me telling him, look, man, you, the chances of you going D1 are absolutely slim to none. Um, you know, there's some certain JUCOs that maybe you want to try. Or, you know, I don't want to tell him that. I want him to work hard. I want him to just keep his dream alive. And I want him to just do the best that he can. Right. You know, and, and like, Blake got all kinds of accolades last year yeah. and that might have helped him a little bit but for the most part i'm like kid that was yesterday yeah you know they want to see what you did this summer they want to see <clears> what you're <throat> going to do next year as a senior and i want to make sure that the fire is still in his belly yeah i have no there's no doubt in my mind that the fire is still in his belly because as you know working with him and talking to him and you know especially about the mental side of the game as well as like how to treat your throwing and the physical side with your and anywhere from hitting just all aspects talking to him i mean he's very motivated um very talented in that regard and he's very skilled and like it's very hard to to, to see that especially nowadays because a lot of players especially a lot of kids that i see coming around that are high school are only in it for the glam yeah only oh, yeah. in it for the status only in it for the aesthetic of baseball versus like if you're good at baseball and you train well at baseball, you automatically fit the mold and the aesthetic. You have the aesthetic, right? You know, like if you take 100 ground balls a day and you work on your form, like you'll look good. I mean, because you're going to get better every day. But if you're just like, oh, I want to look cool, and then you do some little some little click, <laughs> little little g- glove flare or whatever, and then like, you know, bounce off your glove, hits your chest, and then you make like a sidearm throw, 60 poo across the yeah. field, you know? <laughs> Like, Those are the kids that we used to, you know, do the da na na. Yeah, da-na-na. yeah. You might yeah. look cool as you That's fail, but like, yeah. You know what's crazy is like, this kid, Mitch. He was never the flashiest player, but dude, I can't even remember an error that he ever made. Right. Like, you know, he's he's the most consistent guy, and that's really what counts. Because when you're going in for the win, when you're going to the World Series or whatever, you want guys that like that balls hit to you. Like, oh yeah. That for sure. That play is going to be made 110. percent Like I'm not even where I don't even have to back him up. I'm going to back him up, yep. but I don't even have to back him. It's a courtesy backup. My oldest son Corey, when he was at Atascacita, zero errors at second base. It's probably the the least flashy defensive play you'd ever want to see. But when he had a hundred routine ground balls hit to him. He fielded 100 out of 100. Mm-hmm. He never made the diving backhand that, from his knees through sidearm. To, never did that. But he made every single out that any coach could ask of a player. But I think the problem for him when he was trying to, to get to the college level was he didn't have that. He, he just did his job, and that was it. So 
that that's the other thing that kind of bothers me is do you have to be flashy do you know do you have to have that loud voice you know because you know for me it was difficult he was a great pitcher too but he couldn't break glass that's a good point so like i think i think yeah consistency is very important but you also especially like since Corey played at a very very competitive yes. district and with a lot of competitive talented players at his time I don't think consistency was enough. It, I, more, I, yeah. more like you had to shine in your own way. Whether that's like, hey, he's a shut down defender at second base, but you know he also put thirteen over. You know, you kind of gotta have to shine out somewhere. Or like, you know, he may not. Like Corey doesn't. Corey's hundred out of a hundred, but because he also throws ninety four across the back. Like you have to have some sort of quality, just because of I think the circumstances he was in and the player and the high talent he's playing because he played against he played with a lot of flashy guys without a doubt a lot of very um, charismatic uh, swag swag filled guys and like kind of during that time period where baseball was having that turnover from old school to new school uh-huh. new school was sexy and like all of a sudden now you got kids reinvested in MLB the show like that was <laughs> I believe that's around his time when he was graduating because uh-huh. I was already past college i was already done yeah one of the funniest funniest stories that i was there to watch was the kid that was playing second that day uh he made a beautiful over the shoulder just straight out to the outfield diving catch and everybody just went crazy i mean crazy problem is the next two innings he missed two of the most routine ground balls you'd ever want to see and he came up to me after the game and i said how you doing, big guy? He goes, good, coach. Did you see that play? And I went, I did. He said, what'd you think? I said, cool. It, it was, it was, you know, top ten ESPN. Question for you. And he looked at me. He's like, yeah, coach. I go, what happened to the two ground balls the next couple of innings that you missed? Just, you know, wanting him humor to humor me. Yeah, yeah, humor me. And he goes, huh? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But that catch I made, and I went, that's all he cared about. Right. You know, and I just looked at him like, okay, you probably have probably about 100 more attempts before that happens to you again, where the routine ground balls, you're going to get 10 of those a game. So I'm missing something here. Right. And you'll, you'll probably appreciate this story. It was like, I think it was my, oh, God, it might have been my, it was my junior year. I'm in center field. We we're playing George Mason. And this is kind of like, <clears throat> it was cool and terrible at the same time because like it really showed how much respect and how much confidence my team had in me so like going into the ninth inning our closers in he's got the all-time close record um mr bars um and he he pitched and it's the last out we're playing at george mason very windy day like i mean it was a good day typical day like we're just taking care of business friday game go in whoop their ass and then like you know we're up like six i'm two for four i'm having a good day Ball sitting in the air, pop fly, hot, high pop fly. And I mean, I'm just underneath it. And I'm like this, like I call it off. I'm like, I got it, I got it, whatever. And like, all of a sudden, like, I'm I'm like on my back heel, cause I'm like, hey, this ball's kind of coming in. And then a wind gush just blows it and it goes right over my head. So already hugely embarrassed. Sadly, it's a hit for my closer because the ball was blown so far back, it didn't even touch my glove. Right. And I would have wore that air. Like, I deserved the air, because that ball should have been caught. There was no excuse. And I turn around, I pick up the ball. The kid's standing on second, but my team's nowhere around. Like, half of them are off the field. My pitcher has already walked off. And I chuck the ball as hard as I can. I think I, I think it was our third baseman. was, like, one hop to him, and he's, like, near shortstop, because, he, thank God, he's my roommate. <laughs> he was, he's paying attention, keeping me humble. And... Uh, he caught the ball and everyone like started jogging back onto the field and everyone of course everyone's looking at my coaches are all just looking at me like this and I'm like, like I'm sorry. Don't like, ask. I'm like, like I don't know what happened either. Like I'm embarrassed. Strikes the next kid out. And um, I jog off the field and I was like, Tyler, I'm so sorry. I don't know what the that wind came in last second and went right over my head. And he was like, he's like, Oh no, you're fine, you're fine. And then like my coach obviously is shoving kids out the way and be like, What happened? I was like I don't I don't know. Like I was like, I'll never have it again. Like the wind just blew blew that ball straight over my head. I didn't couldn't see it coming and and I was just like and like everyone's like, Are you okay? Like, are you okay? All this stuff and I was just like, Yeah, I don't know. Like they're like, We just thought you'd catch it. <laughs> yep. I was like, I'm already walking out, we just thought you caught it and I was like, Yeah, I know. I'm 
terrible. I feel bad. And that was it, like it was cool that they trusted me so much that they were like, Jordan's got it. We're off the field, and mm-hmm. then so embarrassing that now they have. They'll probably have a little bit of exactly. hesitation. They'll take two steps and go. Well, wait, we he did drop that yeah, one time. Yeah, we better wait. No, yeah, that was well, that was embarrassing. But like that, I just felt like that needed to come out. No, because I have had a video of Blake in center. Uh, same thing. It was so funny. The ball went up. It was routine, and I looked in the video, and there goes the third baseman, pitcher, catcher. Everybody's just jogging off the field, and the ball was still 20, 30 feet in the air. Yeah. And I looked at Blake. I said, "What? What would happen if you'd have dropped this?" He goes, "Panic." Uh, I don't know. I said, "You really wouldn't have anybody to throw the ball to." And he started laughing because I showed him the video, and I guess he never really has seen that before. But that's what I told him. Same thing. I said, "Look how much everybody trusts you." Yeah. They all jogged off the field. Third baseman. He didn't even turn around and look. He's jogged off the field. And I was like, thank God you did not drop that. I mean, they weren't even looking. I don't know. It's scary. That's happened to me in college, and it's happened to me in high school. Same thing with Brady May. Left field, something flew right into my eye. Don't know what happened. That ball hit my glove, popped right out. Brady was already off the field. I felt so bad. Oh, no. Yeah, his, I know. His, his, dad, you, his dad. My dad was sitting next to his dad. Imagine quotes. having to explain that. Yeah. <laughs> like... He's, I think Brady, he might have been throwing a no-hitter for all I know. Like, I don't even know. Like, I felt terrible. Like, no one was harder <laughs> on me than me. Like, right, right, which like, isn't a bad thing. Right, yeah, but I was just like, it was just one of those things, like varsity, I'm a junior. Like, <laughs> guy, guy got to be. Like, like, that's, like, at that time, that wasn't Aaron. I, I, I took that, and I was like, holy crap. How you ate that one? Yeah, dude, literally, like, the fact that I, I remember it's, like, my it's my worst nightmare. It's the yeah, bane of my that, existence. that's the thing is, it's, you know, you don't remember the score of that game. You don't remember what happened, but you will remember that. I will that remember play. that. Yeah, horrified. Horrified. I think I remember every error I've ever made yeah. from, like, high school on. There's no question. That's, like, that's how few there are, but, like, that I remember every but single still, one. Yeah, yeah, that's what you expected out of your game. Exactly. You know, so if one error would just kept you up at night right and, so and what kind of what kind of like i guess lack of things do you see from players around blake's age like is it um skill development is it mental side issues is it um mental toughness or is it just like not knowing the game or not being able to react i, I think the, one of the first things i always see every game right now is is their baseball iq uh i, I see just kids just making mistakes that i don't know freshmen maybe make uh you know it, it, it talking it, about like on plays uh, yeah it, double cuts uh, where to be when the ball's hit or do they know where they're going before the ball's even hit right you know i, I see kids and I'll, I'll i'll give you my opinion on how why that is but you know that that's the stuff i see you know i, I blake would come up in center looking for his cutoff man he's nowhere there's, there's nowhere to be found you know and and when you talk to them after, I said, you know, what happened? Uh, Coach, I, just, I, just, I guess I just didn't realize I was the cut. Yeah, no, that can't happen. I'm like, what are you talking And my next question is to, to them is why it answers, it answers the whole thing. What do you mean you didn't know? Well, I, I was never taught that. And what do you mean you were never taught that? You were never taught the basic cut? It goes back, unfortunately, and I don't know I'm going to make like a lot of people years. mad on this one, is – is select ball. Select ball coaches, all they want is that ring. I don't, for one reason or another, I don't know. Well, cl- clarify, like select ball, I understand, I agree, but like what age? Because I think if you're, I think at high school, you should know where everyone, you should know where every position, every person needs to be by Absolutely. the time you're 14. Absolutely. Because at the age from 13 and under, no one is recruiting you. No one, no one is scouting you out. You should be learning everything you can about the game and getting as better at the game as you possibly can. That's the whole reason why those kids need to practice is no to understand the game. No question. You don't need to have I – don't, I don't believe you need to have practices for your travel ball team in high school. Like, at that point, you should be good enough. You should have a couple tools under your belt. You should understand the game perfectly that you can walk on the field with eight strangers and play the, as good as you can get, as good as you can be in front of scouts because you're trying to make it to a team. You know, right, you're going way back. Right, when 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 travel ball first started, but back then, you know, when I was when I was, you know, coaching at Kingwood High School, running their summer and fall program. Back then, that select ball was what it was called. That was the best of the best back then, 
And like you just said, you put nine guys on that field, you didn't have to worry about what he was going to do, the guy next to you. Right. Because everybody just knew that much of the game, that all you got to do is throw those guys out on the field, and, and you've got an all-star team. Right. Now, we all know it's pretty watered down. And when you see some of these select coaches, like I said, I'm going to piss a lot of people off, but so what? It's just the truth. They're in it for one thing, to win. When I hear some of the, some of these dads that I talk to talk, it, it, my, my mind just, my head just aches. Mm -hmm. Because it's, well, we're playing majors now. Uh, I think we'll be moved up because we're, you know, 14 and 2. <laughs> what is that got? Who cares? And, and, and when we were coaching at Kingwood High School, I would tell that we have a parent meeting, 100 parents in the stands. And I would look at them and every year say the same thing. Okay, now I don't want your kid's resume. I don't care what level he played at. I don't, I don't care what he did. I don't, I don't want to know how many rings they've got. What do I want to know? Does he know where to go on a double cut? Right. Okay. And then the other thing was, this was the funniest part, was I'd go, well, let me, let me explain to you why we don't care. So can I see a show of hands uh, whose son here plays shortstop? 95 hands go up. Okay, see, that's Can't the thing. That. Yeah, I go, we don't, <laughs> we don't need 95 shortstops. Okay? <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah, I said, so, you know, let me see a raise, show of hands of the kids. Okay, and I would throw just a scenario at them. You know, ground ball down the line, all the way to the fence. It's a double, guaranteed. Okay, you're at shortstop. Where are you on the double cut? No one can answer it? No. I mean, there's a reason why it's called daddy ball. I mean, I, let's just face facts. There's For so sure. many teams out there now that they're not worried about, okay, does my son know the fundamentals next year as a freshman? They just went, well, coach, I have, we have nine rings. Oh, okay. Okay, Tom Brady. Yeah, because, you know, we, we <laughs> sat there and in the very first practice as freshmen, I'd say, all right, good luck, gentlemen, because we're about to find out what you know. Yeah. And, and we would just drill them into the ground. And I would look at my brother and just go, we got a lot of work to do. And that was the unfortunate part about it. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the whole goal of, of my brother and I when we were coaching there, when we were running their fall and summer program for them, was by the time they got to coach Denny in the spring, he had nothing to worry about but winning. So we, it was our job to teach the fundamentals, where everybody needed to be on the field when they were asked to do it. But you're saying, but I think we're at a point now with the modern day version of the game that um, they have to know this going into high school now. You'd hope so, you really do. Because I know, you know, I, and this isn't bragging, this is just the truth. We won the state championship in 2005. Mm -hmm. And part of that reason was, and Coach Denny was the one who said this, was I've got two coaches over here that they didn't care whether they won or lost. By the time these guys got to me, they knew everything about every fundamental there is to know on the field. And that's the reason why we won that championship. Because our job was we had one goal, done. That was it. Yeah. And, and I think today, you know, there's so many teams, there's so many kids, and some of these dads just, they want to brag, you know. And that's just it, unfortunately. Yeah, I feel like even when I was in college and we worked on, you know, like double cuts and all that, um, I had known what a double cut was, obviously. Right. And I know where to go and where to be. I think the fact that we ran it as a team – and practice was just more so familiarity and chemistry wise and just to you know clean a little maintenance up all that stuff to see how fast we can do it, it was more about fat like speed sure. at that point absolutely and efficiency versus like hey you go over here you go over there it's more like hey you gotta turn around get that sure. you gotta scream out his name so he knows exactly what direction where to turn because that so basically you guys were working game time speed correct yeah oh yeah, yeah. for sure like we'll be in our thing hits it into the gap i get to it first I need my um, my shortstop or second base or whoever was coming out, depending on which gap it was. Let's say it's the short, so my shortstop would come out. Tim, Tim would scream like, "Cut three, cut three, cut three. And because I can hear 
approximately where he is, I can immediately catch the ball and just you, turn right. into it. You knew where you cut off. Yeah, was. exactly. And then I just at this point my range is like a ten yard range, and I'll find him, and then I'll fire it in. And I I remember like the like advanced part of working on the double cut is where to hit him. Like, do you hit him in the chest? Do you hit him at the face? I always aim a little bit above his head and to the into his throwing side. Right. So that way, if he needs to, he can just in one cut it, or I have enough on it to where he can just let it go. I hit the double cut or one hop the double cut. Yeah. He makes the relay. Whatever it's about speed at that like, point, right? The biggest thing for us is like when I was teaching double cut, I take my outfielders and say, okay, so let's just say you're going left center gap. Play's coming three. Okay, who are you going to hit? And they would go, I'd say it's a double cut. So you have primary, secondary. Right. Who are you going to hit? And they'd all look at me and they'd go, um, I said, do you guys know? And some of them just straight up said, I, uh, I said, guys, think about this. Shortstop, second baseman, who do you think is going to have a better arm? Shortstop, correct. So if he's the primary cut, hit your primary cut. Right. I said, because they're, they're the ones that the guy might try to stretch it out to inside the park. So let's, let's go. So we did, we did as much as that. Just the outfielders knew, okay, this guy's got a stronger arm than this guy. But if it's, uh, if it's, on, the, if it's on the right side, you, if you're going to hit the stronger cut, you then go you're you hit second, second guy. Third. Exactly. So that's Makes stuff. sense because your stronger arm's in right field anyway. Right. So I said, that's the guy that you want to go after. So those are the things that we focused on. The biggest thing for us that made that team so successful was one thing. We kept them together all year. Chemistry. That that time period, Coach said, I, I like your approach on this. I'm going to tell these guys. They can go play on another team. But when it comes down to it, this team's going to be everything. So we got to keep them together the entire year, through summer, through fall. They were playing together every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, my joke with the team was, look, by the time this is over with, you're going to know what he had for breakfast, even if you didn't call him. So you're saying that baseball IQ is probably one of the biggest different ma difference makers no you see. No question. It's a thinking game. Correct. Everybody knows that. Very analytical. Yep. So I, our approach was, these guys are going to know what that guy's thinking and what that guy's thinking by the time this is all said and done. Because one of the biggest things we did, too, because that was our job, we would – uh, he's not doing too well at second. You know what? Well, let's move him here. Let's try so and so here. Let's try this double double play combination up the middle because these guys, they're in they're in sync with each other. Yeah. So that was our job. By the time spring came around, coach knew where everybody was going to be playing because he watched. He would come to all the games. That's another thing too. Every game, and he afterwards we'd go. Sometimes we'd go to lunch with coach the next day and go, "What'd you think about that combination? I liked it." Switch this guy and this guy. Let's see what happens. All right. We do the same thing with the lineup. Yeah. Who's your leadoff? Well, we'll find him. You know, who, who's your cleanup? We got it, coach. We'll find him for you. Mm -hmm. And we would mess with the lineup constantly. I didn't care if somebody came up to me and said, coach, I'm a shortstop. I played shortstop my entire career. Good. Go to right. Yeah. You know, we had a lot of we had a lot That's of That's what parents. I got told. <laughs> yeah. We got a lot of parents that were just absolutely mad with it. And I didn't care. They can be mad all they want. Mm -hmm. My job was to figure out what team is going to be the best to put out on that field. That was our job. And for some reason, they didn't hate us too much after we won the state championship. You it's know. kind of hard. Yeah, we It's kind of hard to hate after that. Yeah, exactly. But I don't see that much anymore. You know, I see great teams, but do they have the chemistry? That's the key. You guys both played college ball. Mm -hmm. So you know how tough that is, especially in college, because these guys have never played together before. So what these college coaches expect is what you said earlier. I don't have to teach you this. Get your butt out to the field and let's play baseball. Exactly. They don't have to teach them the, the fundamentals that, that they don't teach anymore. Yeah, I think, I think one of the hardest things about being a head coach is to get your whole team united onto yeah. one front. Especially like, um, in college. Yeah, cause, I mean, you got, you got kids that are 18, immature, coming in, seeing a lot of things for the first time. You and, know, and, then, and both of you two would know this, but I know uh, when I got to college, every every we had nicknames for a lot of the guys. But Correct, the key yeah. nickname was Imy. 
And they and everybody would go, what does what that mean? So they're the guys that started every sentence with I and ended it with me. I'm mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, what's that going to do for me? Absolutely nothing. Yeah. You, know, you didn't want that nickname. I think, I think when it comes to team chemistry, it was kind of I, – I was in a position where, like, my team, like the, the upperclassmen didn't talk to the freshmen. Like, we had this weird – and I think it's dumb. We had this weird setup where there was like an upperclassman side, like literally separated by like a little doorway. And then there was an underclassman side and like all the upper class. And this is just from tradition of like, you know, back from being Hayes, like, like, <laughs> like you're, you're a little freshman. Don't talk to me. Right. All this stuff. Like, I'm, yeah. Or like, you don't know I'm, I'm top dog around here. And like it, like there's only like a couple ways you could get the upperclassmen to respect you. Um, if you were, in their eyes, cool enough for them. Um, two, if you proved yourself on the field, which is obvious, which is the easiest way. Right. Prove yourself on the field. And then um, three, if you were, uh, if you just took what they said without batting an eye. <laughs> um, I fell into number two because I immediately, I imme way. yeah, it was the easiest way and I immediately revolted to um, doing whatever they said. <laughs> That actually put me in the doghouse for a little bit. <laughs> it was like day two. I was like, I'm not. <laughs> like, I'm not into that. How, how dare you talk to me like this? Like, yeah, kind of ego. We also took that because that's the way it was for the longest time. Yeah. Well, we took that and threw it out the window. And what I mean by that, especially like in the summertime, we took all the incoming freshmen and they were for about the first three weeks into the summer because we practiced a lot and we did it for the younger guys. And, we, and I told my upperclassmen, especially my seniors, this isn't for you. I know you know how to do this. But for this program to be successful, right. I want you guys to mentor these freshmen. I want you to teach them how we do things around here so that I didn't have to do it. And the other reason why I liked that was having the seniors or the upperclassmen teach the freshmen, it taught them what they knew, what the freshmen knew. And all of a sudden, instead of just being out there, they were teaching. Mm -hmm. And you could see them go, huh, I, never, I wonder if I didn't know that. Well, I'm going to make sure this kid does. So they taught our way on that field. Yeah. And so the freshmen, within two, three weeks, were almost caught up to the upperclassmen because the upperclassmen were the ones that were teaching these guys. And it made a difference in them, big time, because of that routine right there of, you know, I, you're a freshman. Go away. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't even want to talk to you. I got rid of that, or we got rid of that, because they're full of experience and knowledge. So there was no way we were gonna just let that go out the window. Right. Yeah. And I was kind of for me like the the upperclassmen kind of took to me, and they would. I was in the I was in the baseball group chat, but all the freshmen are not in it. They put in two representatives. They put me and another kid, and they're like, you, it's your job to tell the freshmen everything that we say. So it would be like, practice at 1.30. I have to make another group chat with the other freshmen and tell them to practice you at 1.30. Oh, I'm not. Like, I still got it on group me. <laughs> like, and uh, there's another, like, like, really like, hey, you know, um, we're all going to so-and-so's house, team meeting, whatever, go here. Or, hey, you guys – so and so needs to pick up this in the locker room because it's their turn. Like I have to go, and I'm like I'm like this middleman. It's weird. That that's but okay. like, but like we ended up almost winning the whole entire tournament because of like we united as a team. Like even though we were divided like by class, kind of it was like what united us on the field was our goal because they projected us to be last in the whole entire conference, and like that, and then like the previous the coach previous before that had rubbed some people the wrong way, like. Everyone's like, yeah, we want to show the whole Atlantic 10 what we want sure. to do. And that brought us together. And therefore, that's, that chemistry alone took us far. Because sure. I don't think we were the most talented. We had a lot of good dudes, but we weren't the most talented at that point. And then the following year, the following year when we did win it all is when we had two – we had everyone on the same goal, on the same agenda. Like, we were so close to going to a regional, guys. Like, how, how crazy. Like, everyone come on that. And the freshmen understood, and they easily adapted to, like, Oh, you guys are here to win. Like we also want to win. Like that'd be cool. Like yeah. we haven't gone back to regional in twenty three years or whatever, you know. And so like they all bought in, and we ended up did achieving that. And then it got to a point like my junior year, we were very like we weren't we weren't we weren't united at all. We had a lot of people with a lot of egos. 
because of the success. We had a lot of people that wanted to make their mark, but like wanted to do it their way. We had people, we had, there was a lot of turmoil with my junior year team. And then my senior year team, I think it was more like we had like upperclassmen who had done it like the hard knocks way, kind of like how I had grown up. And then we had a bunch of like, it's a whole nother generation of kids. Right. And they kind of grew up like, hey, let's have fun types of like we play our best baseball when we're having fun and laid back having a good time versus like hey we got to get serious lock in and absolutely deal baseball because you know what's fun winning like and it's two different mindsets and right. those mindsets clashed very hard i can see that so it's like you know when you, we would get on somebody i would kind of take it like yeah i gotta i gotta get i gotta i gotta freaking do it like i don't know i gotta pull my head out of my ass type thing and get going but like on some of these kids you'd be like hey you gotta you get on them and they shut down. And now you've p- took that kid out for the whole game. Right. <laughs> and he's useless. Now you got a liability. Like, and it was, it was interesting going through my whole entire college career, seeing how different people reacted, sure. how different parts of the team react, and then, like, you know, trying to find that chemistry. Because I've, I've been on a team where that chemistry is there, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, like, this is magical. Like, I feel like I'm in a dream. Everything's going perfectly. And then I've also been on teams where the chemistry just doesn't click and it doesn't mesh. You know, and I also think recruiting has a lot to do with that because no question. you have a, a coach that recruits the same kind of players that think the same kind of way. Gonna, yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's very much easier, but we had a, we had a coach turnover. Right. So we had one coach who thought a certain way, and he had half of his guys, and then our new coach came over, and he brought in his guys, and it just didn't me- it, it meshed kind of. I'm not saying we were, like, anti and hostile against each other. It wasn't. It was just, like, the culture sh- sure. shift was very hard to mesh together. Yeah, because most people don't realize. Most people meet. All right, he's recruiting the best shortstop or the best third baseman. But personalities have a lot to do with how they recruit. Yeah. And most people don't know that. You know, and, and you that's why I always tell some of these young kids, you know, I'm thinking about playing so-and-so. Do you know the coach? Uh, I mean, I know he coaches there. Yeah, well, you might want to learn him. If you want to be recruited by him or if you don't want to be recruited by him, you've got to understand where he is. Right. Like you said class and because two two different coaching styles you know, that has a lot to do with recruiting right you know it does but uh blake has the opportunity to be a team captain his senior year next year and coach told him look these young kids they're gonna look up to you mm-hmm. and so i told blake just be who you are and they'll follow so you want to be the type of kid that you you know i, I said i know it's going to be tough that you, maybe you don't want that responsibility, but it's just something that's going to be thrown on you. Okay, but I said that doesn't mean you have to change who you are. Correct, and I also, that's a, that's a good point that you brought up. I had a kid, um, he just committed to Ranger Junior College, mm-hmm. just signed, um, Ethan Allen. He texted me a year ago. He's like, hey, uh, how, do I, how do I be a great leader? It's, he's going into his senior year, and you know he's been doing really well uh, grade-wise, and sport wise and he's looking good and um it's it's pretty much i in my eyes it's pretty much a gimme he's going to be their guy and i said a leader comes in many forms and i said there's not just one there's no one way to lead somebody i was like you're dealing with people people are different people change the atmosphere is different you got to be able to read the room there's social norms and all that i kind of broke it down it's kind of it's kind of getting confused (laughs) and i go i go listen i was like i'll make it very simple i was like what kind of person are you are you kind of person that that speaks with their words and are very good with their words. Are you very good with your actions? Are you a very quiet leader? Are you a very are you a very quiet person? Or are you a very outspoken person? I was like, whatever you are, be yourself and use it to your advantage. I was like, I'm a very outspoken guy, and I'm going to voice my opinion, and then I'm going to do everything I can to keep my word on that. Um, I also know like we've had a there's all the there's other types of leaders where like hey he doesn't really talk much, but he's going to do his job. And he's going to execute it 10 out of 10 times. He might not be the guy to pick you up and say, come on, buddy, you can do a good job. But he's going to be like, I got it. And he's going to go out there and do it. And that's inspiration in and of itself. That's leadership. That's another form of leadership. There's another guy that can just get you all pumped up and amped up right before you go and take the field. And he's a leader whether he starts or not. Like, there's different types of leaders. And I was like, whatever you are, whatever kind of person you are, take your best qualities and push that onto the team. That's a leader. And then... The easiest, and I guess also the hardest part, have the merit to do it. Right. Execute. Be the top guy. Because, like, I don't care if I am better than you and you're telling me what to do. Like, I mean, like, there's a difference between encouraging somebody and then telling somebody what to do. 
as a, as a leader, right? Um, I'm not going to listen to you. Like, if you can't, like, if I, if there's no merit, there's no reason for you to bag me up, like, hey, you got to have that. You got to have that play. Like, I made a diving play in the alpha. You got to have that play. If I go, I know for a fact you can't do that play, or you would have been at least close as I was, right? do not talk to me. That's kind of, that's, that's the kind of person I am. <laughs> but, like, you know, like, so therefore I took that as, like, a personal statement. You know, like, I will get on somebody, or I will tell, tell someone to do something, or do like that, not disrespectfully, of course, but because they know that, like, yeah, Jordan would have done that. Jordan would have worked out harder. Sure. Jordan would have made that play. Therefore, like, come on, like, I'm bringing the whole level up. That's kind of leader I was, but I don't know how he ended up leading his team. But they went, they did, they went to the second round of playoffs, and he was the best player by far, and he did outstanding. So, you know, um, I think Blake will absolutely be good leader. Um, he's the only kid I think that has a chance at breaking records on records of records at K Park. Like he literally has it, the whole scene is set. So, you know, like yeah. it's, it's up to him. Um, but I mean, I wish him a good, I wish him the best of luck this season. Um, I know he's got a very important fall, very important spring. And um, you should be excited because it's literally, it's all right there for the team. Well, since this is your podcast, it's time to blow your head up a little bit, but uh, there's no question this entire summer, Blake has based his 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 every game, every at bat with what you told him. And he is, I mean, taken to it like like a fish to water. He he's he understands what you're telling him now. And every time an at bat finishes or we're riding home or doing whatever, I looked at him, I said, what approach did you use that second time up? Yeah. And he looks at me, he goes, well, I was thinking my first at bat that, you know, I, he, I, I was 3-0. So I said to myself, I'm just going to sit fastball. And and blew my mind, Dad, that I got an off speed. I said, so you missed the pitch. He goes, big time. But I understood, okay, now I know what you're thinking. Yeah, it's not about him as a hitter. It's right. about him as a pitcher. pitcher right? Yeah, and, and so I told him, I said, good. And now every time I talk to him and I bat, the first thing he says was, well, I, I, I felt good on my approach. That's good. That's good. And, and it, it's changed his, his approach. It's changed his at-bats. And I think the other, the great thing about it is uh, he was lefty on lefty when we were in Atlanta, and, and this kid just tore him apart. And I really cool. expected to hit for him to be down on that, you know. And he looked at me, and he goes, yeah, he, he just he outthought me on that one. Mm-hmm. And I looked at him like, nice. So he's, he's going to the plate, and he, even after the results, like one kid struck him out on three straight pitches, one fastball, two sliders on the outside, lefty on lefty, and he was done. And I expected him to be just really down and out about it, but he looked at me, he goes, he outthought me on that one, Dad, which is fine because, you know, now I know what yeah. I'm going to do my next yeah, time up. Exactly. So I just looked at him, and I was like, yeah. You could see he's getting a little bit more mature uh, out of that bats because we talked about it one time and I said look kid you're getting to the point now where you can't just use your ability to react to yeah. react you can't sit there wait for the pitch to be halfway to the plate and go oh that's a fastball correct because it's gone because I said because now you've been facing a lot of guys throwing 90 plus and as you can tell even you you superman yourself it's not working for you it's not you can't and uh so I've, I've it's it's been I love watching him now at the plate because it's all competitive. It's all okay. Throw me the fastball. I dare you. And he's had some great hits this summer because he said, "Dad, I watched. This is this is how I know he's understanding." Because it, it made me smile eight miles wide. I said, "Nice shot." He goes, "Yeah, I was watching." He said, "The four guys in front of me all got fastballs first pitch." So be a coincidence. So he looked at me and he said, "So I went up there with the approach of throw me that fastball. I dare you." Yeah, man, and he did. And how easy is it to hit it when he, you know? It's yeah, coming. and he said, "Yeah, you know that triple down the line." I said, "Yeah." He goes, "It was I. I don't know. The pitch looked like beach ball because I knew what was coming." And I said, "And did you stick with that?" He goes, "No question." You know, instead of going, well, I don't know what he's going to throw, so I'm just going to stand here. Yeah. I, I told him, I said, so you're going to have ugly strikeouts. He goes, no. That's part of the learning process. That's a lot of people don't realize is when you're developing an approach, right? Everybody's approach is different because everyone swings different. Everyone has different stats, all that stuff. 
Yada, yada, yada. But like, I know Mitch's approach is nothing near what my approach was. All right. I mean, we're, we're two different hitters. We're, we're like, we're two different types of players, two different types of heroes, right? So, you know, Mitch, Mitch, I don't know what Mitch's approach is, was entirely, but I know from my approach, when I started using it in high school, it worked because like it was a high school approach. And then on my summer league team, going into my freshman year of college, I played in a college summer league, you know, 18 years old, and I struck out more times in that summer league than ever. Like it had me questioning like, Am I good enough to play baseball at the college level? Because I was. Why did that happen, though? Oh, because the pitch advanced. It was so much more advanced. Whereas my approach in high school was if it's straight over the plate, crush it. <laughs> How simple is that, right? If he throws an off-speed pitch, if he throws an off-speed pitch, take it because you have. He has to throw it two more times to get you out. And on the sec and after he throws it one more time, like after I got two strikes with two curveballs, like. I'm looking for it now. Yeah, like simple. Yeah, like now, now I just gotta make contact, and I'll probably get a single out of it. And so then, um, so then, like, yeah. So like, when I got to that college level, you know, hard slider, boom, first pitch, and I'm just like, why? Because I just took his fastball to the wall. Makes sense. Like, I would throw me an off speed pitch too. Like, all right, now, um, what does go? Oh, curveball inside corner, boom. Like, oh, he kind of looked like he meant to throw it there. <laughs> you know, and then uh, slider. Maybe black, but it's moving away. Strike three, you know. I'm, I'm just can, I'm just can, I'm just can, and you know, my dad's looking at me like, I haven't seen you strike out this much in a long time, and I was like, I, I know, like I don't know what I'm doing wrong, and then I, I recognize like it's not my swing, it's not my, it's not my, uh, it's not my at bat. It's how it's your approach. It's, yeah, it's how it's my approach and how yeah. I'm perceiving it, and you know, learning all that, and getting my ass well, I think I batted like what two ten, like, nothing impressive. <laughs> 210 with like 30 strikeouts. Like, I mean, those were valuable ass kickings that I took. And so when I went to when I went to college, you know, we kind of like my I had I had another assistant coach, or my whole coaching staff was all big about the approach. And when I, I dove into it and I learned it and I understood it, and that's how I ended up becoming like a 300 plus batter throughout my whole college yeah. career. Right. It's, and the nice thing is is Blake understands what you two bring to him. Yeah. Uh, and what I like is, you know, he's going into his senior year, so it's a little bit earlier for him that he's understanding the approach. Because one thing, now the both of you two are sitting in this room, it's pretty funny, and this is how much I know it means to him was you saw what Joey did to him that yeah. game. Yeah, and our only game we watched. And yeah, the, boy the other day, because he saw him in Atlanta, it made him think about it. The other day, he was sitting there just staring at his phone, and I said, what are you doing? And he looked at me, he said, honestly, Dad, I'm studying Joey for next year. He goes, that's not going to happen again. And I said, so what are, you, what are you looking at? He goes, his pitch sequence, I noticed but his, my first time up, he threw nothing but fastballs. He didn't want to show me his slider, his best pitch yet. And I said, good thought. Same he up. goes, and then I watched my third, second and third at bat. And he set me up with one fastball inside, then he threw me three or four straight sliders on the outside corner. You had a game plan for him. And, and I it told was super him, evident. Yeah, and I told him that. I said, so he goes, so honestly, Dad, that's the approach I'm gonna use next year. Right. I mean, I can't I can't wait till he realizes when like a pitcher is not pitching because it's him, it's pitching because it's a pitcher, and then vice versa. Well, I asked one of his Joey's teammates, and uh, that's exactly what he told me. He said, he said, Coach, he said Blake was the only one that we had a game plan for. Correct. And I said to I said to Blake, I said, there's no better compliment in the world that they were only worried about one player in that yeah. lineup. And, and no greater shooting. insult when it works. <laughs> <laughs> but Blake, what I like is his approach, meaning he said yeah, he's that that's not going to happen again. He's growing yeah. tremendously, and I yeah, can't and, and, it. and it all started with you guys, and so that's what I love. I love the fact that you know one of the first things. Blake says, I'm coming up. He always asks if you one of you two are always gonna be here. And that's what I like because mm -hmm. you know, when you guys have sons, you'll understand this. I don't allow just about anybody to work with Blake except you two. Mm -hmm. Because what I like with you two is you teach this as much as this. Right. It's not physical. It can't be right. this game's way too hard. I mean to, to see him, what he's doing now, compared to just a couple months ago, it's mind blowing. Yeah. Because he he listened and he took what you told him, and he is using. I mean, using it. 
So it's, it's great to watch because you're taking it from here to here. Right. The other thing that I like is even after all the accolades that he got this season, Offensive Player of the Year for the district, all that first team, uh, all greater Houston, all this, nothing, none of that matters to him. Mm -hmm. What matters to him now is what's going to make me better. Correct. I still got away. And he's using what you gave him. And what I like is a lot of kids who get to that level that he just accomplished will just level off. Right. I'm, I'm District 16 5 Player of the Year, Hitter of the Year. Why would I ever worry about that stuff? But to him, that's gone. Right. Because where he's going, they're all like that. Yeah, and he knows that. And that was the nice thing about going to Atlanta. We faced a lot of guys that were throwing 90 plus. Yeah. And if you didn't go up to that plate with the idea of this is the approach I'm going to use, you might as well have gone up there with no bat at all. Yeah. Because these guys were just straight good. Already D1 commits, waiting for the draft. It's exciting. Yeah. I mean, I was watching these kids, and it was amazing to me because it was fun for me. But I'm watching this kid going, this kid's projected to go first and second round, and I get to sit here and watch this. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And Blake sat next to me, and I said, what are you looking for right now on this guy? Uh, well, I've seen him throw, like, two curveballs and three sliders. He just sets you up with his fastball. And I just mm -hmm. looked at him and smiled. And I said, "This he's working on this. I, I notice he's working on this a lot more this summer. It's what's more important. This. Yeah. There's no question. And he, he realizes how far behind he he really was. Like he was he was great up to this point just using natural ability. Which is which is insane in that aspect because I mean Mitch and I had the men, that mental aspect down like our sophomore year. Right? And he uh, like I, I remember you telling me I was like, Yeah, you three eighty and then I asked him like, like what are you thinking when you go up there? And he was just like, uh, crush it. <laughs> and I'm like, Fair, 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 but like what's your plan of attack? What are you looking for? And he's like, um, um a strike and I was like yeah yeah it's good that's good I was like well let's let's dive a little bit deeper you know yeah, and I was like and, I, and, I, and it kind of dawned on me I was like this kid actually physically reacted to hitting 380 and I was like that's kind of stupid because like with an approach for me I had an approach and I batted 400 my junior year but 380 with no approach is almost unheard of yeah which is kind of dumb which is great because <laughs> I, I said Blake you have the, you have the, just the, the ability to play this game and it's just nothing but, uh, I'm just going to see if it's a fastball I'm going to hit. Right. Okay, let's try this. Yeah, and now it's, and I, and it's he's, The thing is, he's realizing that now. Yeah. Because like I said, he's had some, some ugly strikeouts a couple times this summer, which I was hoping for. Right. Because when he came back after the game, I said, tell me what happened at the second time up. I guessed wrong, and I went, okay. I said, what happened? He goes, I, I thought for sure I was going to see the slider, and I got a fastball in the inside corner, and I couldn't catch up. I go, good. Yeah, there's another. No, and he looks at me, and he was like, you're happy situation. that I struck out? I go, I'm happy how you struck out. That's a, there's a difference. That's Correct. what I told him. I said, the fact that you went up with a game plan, and it didn't happen, right. but you weren't upset because you just got outguessed or whatever by the pitcher, I said, Right. You know, those are what you tip your hat to and say, you know. I said, why do you think sometimes when you see major leaguers, they just strike out just looking and then they just take one step and walk back to the dugout? And you hear all the people go, how does a major league pit hitter strike out like that? I said, because the last four times at the plate, he got the, the slider on the outside corner. And, and his coach went, I'd go up there looking for this. Correct. And the pitcher went, well, the last time I struck him out with a slider, he's probably going to look for that. So I'm on bus for Brandon with a 97 right. mile an hour fastball. I said, that's why you see them just walk off. Right. Because they went. A lot of people don't understand, but anyway, Eric, we can be talking for hours and off for hours. <laughs> that's what we're going to do. But <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to wrap this up. Again, I appreciate you coming on this podcast. Can't yeah, wait to have you all again. Yeah, no doubt. This, this, it's fun. It right? is. Yeah. It really is. There's no question. Like, absolutely. For all y'all tuning in, we appreciate y'all. Um, make sure you like and subscribe. Um, thank you guys, and we'll see you next time. Four, all right. three, two. Oh.